Welcome to the third and final part of our story of the spice trade and Arabia. Enjoy! I'm Thomas Dinas, and this is the Delicious Legacy Podcast, an archaeogastronomical podcast where on each episode we go to a different ancient time and examine recipes, ingredients and foods from that era. Today we'll go to the ancient Arabian Peninsula and we'll explore the importance of spices in the ancient uh, Mediterranean, Egypt and Mesopotamia and we'll find out uh, what kick-started this um, incredible spice journey and trade between um, the Mediterranean and the ancient um, Far Eastern lands of Asia. The Arab merchants apparently tolerated the presence of Indian traders in Africa, but reserved for themselves the commerce within the Red Sea. That lucrative commerce which supplied precious stones and spices and incense to the ever-increasing service of the gods of Egypt. The muslins and spices of India they fetched themselves or received from the Indian traders in their ports on either side of the Gulf of Aden, carrying them in turn over the highlands to the Upper Nile or through the Red Sea and across the desert to Thebes or Memphis. One Arab kingdom after another retained the great eastern coast of Africa with its trade in gold and ivory, ostrich feathers and oil. The source of the Arabian Gulf produced an ever-rising value in frankincense and myrrh. Whole cloths and precious stones and timbers and spices, particularly cinnamon, brought from India, largely by Indian vessels, were redistributed at Socotra and carried to the Nile and the Mediterranean. Gera, Obola, Palmyra, Petra Sabatha and Mariaba were all partners in this commercial system. In southern Arabia, well beyond the usual reach of these northern powers, lay the wealthy kingdom of Sabia and its neighbours. The region was both a source of aromatics, frankincense, myrrh and balsam, and an entrepot for the spices that have crossed the Indian Ocean. Some of these were transshipped at Arabia Evdemon, modern Aden, or other closely linked harbours to continue by the sea towards Egypt. Others were transferred here to Kamel Caravan on routes that reached as far as the Mediterranean ports such as Gaza. The best frankincense from the region of Yemen cost the ancient Romans six denarii per pound. That was roughly the same as ginger, more than black pepper and twice the price of cardamom. Myrrh was twice the price per volume at the time because it would dehydrate and thus shrink. However, it wasn't used in the quantities that the Romans transported and consumed frankincense. In late Roman times, the cost of transporting a camel load of frankincense from the southern Arabia Peninsula to the Mediterranean was 680 to 1000 denarii, more than five times the cost of living a year in Palestine during the same era. In exchange of frankincense, each year goods worth close to 10 million denarii would flow back to the 1700 miles from the source of the Mediterranean or from Persia and India. Earlier on, much earlier on, before the Romans, until the Arab and Phoenician seafarers gained a certain competence in maritime navigation, transport of frankincense and other goods over such long distances could be done only by camel. Dromedary camels appear to have been domesticated in the coastal settlements of eastern Arabia. They may have been initially managed as a wild resource for the medicinal value of their milk, which fends off microbial infections of the eye. Just as frankincense offered its antiseptic sap to treat irritations, cancers and tumours in the eyes of the Semitic tribes many, many thousands of years ago. It is not surprising that the first appearance of frankincense beyond its native range. In Egypt, between 3000 and 3500 years ago, was about the time that camels were tamed and reliably used for long distance transport. Remarkably, 
The ancient cuneiform texts found at Al-Balid have been partially deciphered and they confirm that long distance trade of tons of staple foods had begun by 2800 BCE. Sumerian and Akkadian inscriptions from the same period report maritime trade from Mesopotamia to the north on the island of Delmun, southward to Magan on the Arabian Peninsula, and then eastward across the waters of Melukka. This latter place may have referred to the legendary Spice Islands, now known as Moluccas. Indeed, some of the Sumerian and Akkadian inscriptions may be the earliest records of long-distance globalized trade. They indicate that the Semitic tribes of Magan were exchanging copper and perhaps incense, medicines or spices as well, for hundreds of tons of barley. Those enormous quantities of cereal grain traveled down the coast of the Persian Gulf southward past the Straits of Hormuz and along the shores of the Arabian Sea as far as Zafar Harbour. As we have mentioned, Firstly, traders began to use semi-domesticated camels and small sailboats to take these goods far beyond their areas of origin. They moved across continents to cultures that spoke languages they had never previously heard. At first, they retained camels as their sole mode of travel, for they could cover 22 miles of roughly level ground a day. But the traders ultimately sought other means to move heavier loads of spices incense and herbs longer distances than were possible with their beasts of burden. They began to build and equip small doors to sail the open waters of the Arabian Sea and Indian Ocean. Their goal was to travel even farther each day than the strongest camel could, that is, if the winds were in their sails. Of course, by this time, many other cultures around the world had figured out how to navigate the shallow shoals along their open coasts and the backwaters behind nearby barrier islands. They employed boats, buoyant animal bladders and sewn together skins, bundles of reeds or hollowed out palms or tree trunks. And yet, the sailors from the southern and eastern reaches of Arabia began to do far more than that. They erected masts with broad, maneuverable sails on them that could be shifted the direction of the winds they set out to sail directly across the sea, using seasonal winds to take the doves back and forth. Soon, no longer content to navigate along the shores of a bay or shoals of a peninsula, they began to use distant landmarks and the stars to maneuver their way over open waters. Another popular spice of the ancient Mediterranean world was pepper. Pepper was super popular and available in the ancient Roman world. It was regarded as indispensable in Roman gastronomy, was very expensive, especially for the general population whose standard of living was modest, to say the least. Even in later years, in Diocletian in 390 CE, in one of his edicts, uh, he fixed the price of the whole long pepper at 15 denarii a pound and black pepper at 4 denarii. Foreign monarchs gave pepper to Roman consuls and senators, generals and tall figures of authority. And this process was reversed when Alaric, king of the Visigoths, entered Rome victorious in 408 and he demanded the payment of 5,000 pounds of gold, 30,000 pounds of silver and 3,000 pounds of pepper. Also, a large bale of pepper was among the presents sent to Attila by the emperor Theodosius III. And the question is, what on earth was all this pepper used for. Even if uh, the Romans flavored the food with, with it very lavishly, indeed including it in sweet dishes and desserts, it seemed hardly likely that 3,000 pounds could be used in the kitchens of uh, Alaric. More likely was that the possession of pepper, which transcended its gastronomic importance, came to be seen as a symbol of power and virility, qualities reflected of course in its powerful and aggressive flavor. By the time of Augustus, up to 120 ships were setting sail every year from Mios Hormos in Egypt to India. So much gold was used for this trade and apparently recycled by the Kushan Empire for their own coinage. 
that Pliny the Elder complained about the drain of uh, currency to India. India, China and the Arabian Peninsula take 100 million sesterces from our empire per annum at a conservative estimate. That is what our luxuries and women cost us. For what fraction of these imports is intended for sacrifices to the gods or the spirits of the dead? Ginger is another one of these brilliant um, uh, aromatics, flavorings, uh, spices that we use all over the world. And it's been adapted uh, to cuisines from uh, uh, South America to China to Africa and, of course, the Middle East. Um, but as a, as a um, spice, first occurred in southern China and then spread throughout the South and Southeast Asia and, of course, then travelled to ancient Greece and Rome, which was uh, quite popular, but I think it travelled as a pickle. Of course, ginger has this um, piquant bite and uh, the unforgettably zesty citrusy fragrance and a touch of sweetness, of course. Relatives of uh, ginger include um, galangal and um, turmeric and also the the plant that produces the melangeta pepper or grains of paradise. This is another relative of ginger. And we definitely find um, mentions of it in ancient Greek um, writers like Theophrastus, the father of botanology. And of course, uh, it's mentioned in ancient China around 500 BC. Of course, it can be used dried as a powder, pickled and fresh grated in, um, others, with other spices and mixes to create a base, a spicy base for foods. All of this takes us neatly to the Nabataeans, one of the key trading tribes of the Arabian Peninsula in the years around the Roman Empire. They grew a strong and powerful economy based on the spice trade. But Diodorus reports a phase in their economic activity where they took to piracy on the Red Sea. Diodorus says that after a certain period of success in their enterprise, the Nabataeans were caught on the high seas by some quadririums and punished as they deserved. Strabo too seems to make reference to this moment in Nabataean history and he writes, These Nabataeans formerly lived a peaceful life, but later, by means of rafts, took to plundering the vessels of people sailing from Egypt, but they paid the penalty when a fleet went over and ravaged their country. The emergence of Nabataean piracy was probably due to concern of the new seaborne commerce that the Egyptians were developing as a result of the discovery of monsoons. Ships laden with perfume and spices could proceed directly to the ports of Egypt in the appropriate season, and from there the goods could be conveyed to the Mediterranean. The Nabataeans must have soon realized that the new traffic by the sea would be a gradual decline in the overland commerce which have been the basis of their prosperity. Any fears they may have had were grounded, for by the mid-first century AD, the overland traffic through Petra was largely dried up. Of the age-long struggle for control of these sacred lands, we know today little more than the Greek writers of 2000 years ago. The modern world takes its little supply of frankincense from the Arab vessels that carry it. But to the ancient world, the incense land was the true El Dorado, sought by the great empires and fought for by every Arab tribe that managed to enrich itself by trading incense for temple services on the Nile or Euphrates, or on Mount Zion, or in Persia, India, or China. The archaeological expeditions that succeeded in penetrating these forbidden regions and recovered the records of their past added to our records of the treasured scraps of formation preserved by Herodotus, Theophrasus, Eratosthenes, Strabo, Pliny and Ptolemy. Whatever the origins of the Nabataeans, they gradually shifted from looting others to trading. But they didn't trade the way the neighbors had. They sought to more systematically control the management of most, if not all, of the land and sea trade emanating from the incense kingdoms. By employing long caravans of camels along hard to trace routes supplemented by sophisticated ships equipped with oars and sails, they completely eclipsed the Mineans in dominating the many frankincense trails. 
Generally, the Nabataean kingdom was an unusually peaceful state geared solely to profit from trade, with no real borders, no taxation or social unrest and very few slaves. Its strength was that it consistently managed to keep a distance between the producers and consumers of the goods it transported. In essence, the Nabataeans became the first cultural community to be comprised largely of middlemen. They became spies, incense and perfume brokers who developed, maintained and controlled transcontinental trade networks. In fact, hardly any of the goods they moved along the frankincense trails were from their own lands. Their socio-economic function seems to be as the necessary middleman in the trade of frankincense, myrrh, Indian spices and other aromatics across the oceans and between distant lands. To do so, most of them opted to live in the empty space between the grounds where the aromatics were gathered and the urban markets where they were destined to be used. For them, the desert and the sea had become little more than the space to be crossed, for they no longer eked out a living directly from its local resources. Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbian Creek, UK's leading supplier of premium Greek produce, wine, herbs, cheeses, or olive oil. From all over the wild corners of the country and working directly with small artisanal producers. There are many Greek herbs to enhance your dinner plate. King amongst them is oregano, and Malbin Creek has the best organic oregano from Mount Parnonas in the Arcadia region of the Peloponnese. Ancient Greeks thought oregano made the mountains glow. Hippocrates, an illustrious ancient Greek doctor, was accustomed to choose oregano for the treatment of many diseases. But you can use it in sauces, tomato salads, and on meats on your barbecue. You can also try something a little different, savory, which is another strong pungent mountain herb, great in salads with olives and oranges, but also delicious with grilled lamb or mutton. Whatever you need, Malbian Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the exquisite goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK, or you can visit the shop at Art 17 Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermondsey, London. Malby in Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. And for you dear listeners, you can get a serious 15% discount if you go to malbyandgreek.com slash delicious and use that to get 15% off your next purchase. What mattered most was their control of the caravanserais and other safe harbors that could serve as the stations on their journeys across such vastness. Their strength was that the consumers had no direct contact with the producers. So as long as they kept harvesters clueless about who desired the goods and never divulged to the end users where the goods had actually come from, they controlled the value chain along the frankincense trails. This mandate allowed the Nabataeans to profit immensely from the spice trade. For all others in the supply chain had little means of understanding the value embedded in other links in the chain. Pliny the Elder noted that while instances, spices and other products passed from Nabataean hands on their way from Arabia Felix to Gaza, their value accrued to a hundredfold of what it had been when the goods first entered their hands. But the true genius of the Nabataeans may have been their capacity to keep the instances, spices, salvas and silks destined for Europe, Africa and Asia Minor imbued with a sense of wonder. They were marketing mystique as much as they were materials. Perhaps they had learned this strategy from the Mineans who came before them. It was neither the caloric content, not the antiseptic value of the seeds, gums, leaves and barks that sold, cumin, cinnamon, frankincense, labdamon or myrrh. Instead, sales depended on their compelling marketing of the mythic dimensions of these exotic goods. They essentially did what promoters of amaranth, extra virgin olive oil, ginseng and magic mushrooms continue to do today. Beyond the physical properties of the plant or fungus, they brokered the placebo effect to their economic advantage. For starters, the Nabataeans got the Europeans to believe that frankincense had to be expensive because of the stealth that it took to harvest it from the protected groves of the southern Arabia. As the Greek historian Herodotus explained to his fellow Europeans, when gathering frankincense, the burnt storax, and this storax raises a smoke that keeps away the small flying snakes. 
great numbers of them keep guard over all the trees that bear the frankincense. Smoking them out with storax is the only way to get rid of them. So in order to access the divine incense, one must use another smoky fragrance to snatch the sacred substance away from the evil serpents that otherwise serve to protect it. Although this legend was possibly told to Herodotus by some Minean spice trader in the 5th century BCE, the Nabataeans made sure that such stories continued to circulate for several more centuries in the countries remote from the spice kingdoms of Arabia Felix. No doubt the Nabataeans themselves generated equally luminous stories about the places and peoples from which the frankincense was obtained. By this era, no outsiders were permitted to come near the places of origin of frankincense on Mir, nor even enter the caravanserai where they were temporarily stored. Even the heart of Petra, the temple and the trade center that ranked among the greatest in the world by the end of the first century CE, was physically and metaphorically hidden away in the rock. And this is Petra, the magnificent um, archaeological site where our story began with the American explorer Stevens. And also until um, the height of the Roman Empire, the Nabataeans were truly um, lucky and profited from the trade of uh, all these instances and spices. It wasn't until that moment that uh, they became truly wealthy. The Roman elite had become obsessed with the fragrance of frankincense and other precious aromatics, squandering much of their gross metropolitan product on purchase. The Romans wrapped up a considerable portion of their wealth in the conspicuous consumption of aromatics. A significant part of the Roman booty went toward the purchase of incense. Alongside the sacrificial altar, standing on a tripod, was the acera in which frankincense was placed. So central was the burning of this aromatic to Roman ritual that it was admitted into the empire duty-free, in contrast to the 25% duty on most other imports. For so much of the 19th and 20th centuries, most school books would credit the ancient Greeks and Romans as the primary forces that shaped the European civilization. But I want to throw a curveball here, and perhaps we should credit the Nabataeans and their predecessors as the central and chief peoples that exercised the greatest control. This due to the grip they had over the world trade of the era. Maybe they shaped the Greek and Roman culture with their goods and what seemed to be imperative to have on one's temple or dining table. Food for thought. They also influenced culinary practices and demonstrated a remarkable capacity to access the rest of the world's treasures. And yet, except for the graffiti casually left as petroglyphs on the boulders of Negev's regs, we know very little about the private and spiritual lives of these Semitic spice traders. It was only by conjecture that earliest recognized Nabataeans worshipped multiple gods, including the sun god and the fertility goddess, both of these deities were first recorded among the Arab tribe known as Banu Thaqif. But as the Nabataeans became more conversant in Aramaic language and its sensibilities, it appears that the religion was transformed into one that was more monotheistic. Now, as we've seen, it's not only the elites that had um, access to all this stuff. Archival documents from Rome and Athens confirmed that frankincense, pepper and cinnamon were not merely curious for the elite. Nearly every household in these cities regularly burned incense only to disperse the horrendous scents that emanated from the bodies of the seldom bathed, the butcher shops and the sewage reservoirs. Heavenly scents kept the masses from being constantly repulsed by the stench and stupor of their everyday labor. It came to be understood, at least by a few, that trade can impoverish just as surely as they can enhance or enrich. Julius Caesar himself attempted in vain to regulate the Roman culture of excess that was consuming his empire's wealth. He went so far as to send out teams of food and incense police into markets and private homes to ferret out those who were so fixated on conspicuous consumption that they were not only bankrupting themselves but the empire as well. By the time of our common era, 
The trading of aromatics was spanning the far reaches of the known world, from China, Morocco, India and Socotra to Zanzibar in present-day Tanzania and the Lamu archipelago of the coast of Kenya. It was a moment in history when both land and sea trade in the aromatics was ushering an era of truly unprecedented globalization. Intercontinental trade had already become the norm, not the exception. Of course, it depended in large part on people's fascination with the exotic as a way to escape the drudgery and redundancy of their own increasingly domesticated lives. The spice trade had become a mean to capitalize on a kind of psychic hunger that was developing within various civilizations scattered around the world, a craving that came less from an empty stomach and more from a dissatisfied mind. Perhaps... These traders, these restless souls, made a virtue of the so-called homelessness, their nomadic lifestyle, and became more cosmopolitan, unbound by location, just like the storm gods who were traveling deities in every place and not necessarily settled in one land. Semitic and Arabian spice merchants were gifted storytellers and natural polyglots prepared from a young age to combine these two talents to tell compelling stories about the potency of their products and the adventures that had occurred while in transit. Um, if we want to examine another interesting spice, turmeric originated in India, uh, like ginger. The color comes from the rhizome, not as in the case of saffron from the flower stamens. Dioscorides knew that the plant was related to ginger, so he must have seen a piece of a whole root before it was pounded, since the spice is used as powdered. He mentions it's Indian in origin. He mentions its bitter flavor and its rather surprising usefulness as a depilatory. Turmeric was never particularly popular in Western Europe. However, the Arabs and Persians were very fond of it, and looking no further than its brilliant color, took it from another form of saffron and called it curcum. The Spanish, almost the only people in medieval Europe who really liked it, turned this word to curcuma. The English turmeric may be from a late Latin expression of unknown origin, terra merita, meaning deserving or deserved earth. Throughout Asia, turmeric is regarded as a magical plant because of its color. It is associated with the most agricultural and social rituals. A clump of turmeric is planted in the middle of the paddy fields to bring luck and just as Arab women dye the palms of their hands and the soles of their feet with henna for festive occasions, Indian Tamil women color theirs with turmeric for weddings. Its pronounced aroma, peppery flavor and bright color make turmeric one of the most popular spices added to Southeastern Asian cookery. Although it has a rhizome like ginger and turmeric, cardamom is the third essential ingredient in curry powder and it's grown only for the seeds inside the fruit capsules. Virgil said that um, the Assyrian cardamom shall spring up on every soil. For long before the Europeans had um, ever heard of curry, cardamom was being sold in the markets of Babylon, Thebes, Athens and Rome. Theophrasus mentions it and Joscuridis classes it amongst medicines in his uh, Materia Medica uh, at around 65 of our common era. Amomon, a word deriving from the ancient Semitic languages used by the first foreigners who encountered it and liked this Southeast Asian spice, may be translated as very spicy, very strong. The root of the word occurs again in Greek, cardamom, cress. Karadra means the bed of the stream where the spicy flavored watercress was gathered. Of course, we're not entirely sure if that's the correct um, <laughs> etymology of the word, but um, it seems quite plausible. In the 3rd century AD, Athenaeus wrote of the classical Greek period. The following seasonings are listed by Antiphanes. Grape juice, salt, cooked wine, silphium, cheese, thyme, sesame, natron, cumin, pomegranate, honey, marjoram, fine herbs, vinegar, olives, green stuff for sauce, capers, eggs, salt fish, cress, 
garlic, juice. Notice the word cress, which is the one that's used for cardamom, and not um, the one we just said. We guess the reason is that it wasn't yet used in uh, the kitchens of the Greeks. Latin authors were unsure of the botanical description of, of cardamom. Pliny calls it the seed of a vine, not as has sometimes been supposed from too cursory reading, which could have been the correct description of pepper, although he was not very accurate about pepper either. The first use of cardamom, because of its exquisite aroma, was as a suitable burnt offering to the gods. The Greeks and Romans then mixed it with wax to make solid perfumes. They put these perfumes into shells worn gypsy fashion in the hair or pinned to the clothing. Cardamom was also used as a dental um, hygiene supplement um, since it was chewed after a meal and would neutralize the taste of uh, garlic. It also soothed and disinfected sore throats, was good for a cough and expelled intestinal worms. Naturally enough then, it found its way into sauces for food. And there is even one recipe given by Apicius where cardamom is used to season truffles in combination with oil and garum. The cardamom seeds, preferred at the time, were still green and slightly soft. The darker, dried seeds were a little cheaper. Chicken in white sauce with a puree of leeks was flavored with cardamom. This dish was a favorite of the young and deranged um, emperor Heliogabalus, who may have been greedy but was not, as has been claimed, himself an amateur cook. The recipe for chicken with cardamom sounds delicious, by the way. And that's it. This is it for today. I hope you enjoyed um, our adventure through time and throughout the Arabian Peninsula and uh, the Red Sea. And um, we should thank this um, risk-taking adventures desert people like uh, the Yemeni Omani and other Arabian tribes that um, brought us uh, these flavorsome and tasty spices to our cuisine. Of course, the spice trade continues long after the so-called fall of the Western Roman Empire and the Middle Ages and medieval times and kind of it's been controlled by the Arabs until then. And then we come to the age of discovery and exploration and exploitation, which is definitely going to be another episode on that one. So stay tuned. I would like to thank my voice actors, Mark Knight, Jim Bryden, Baron Anastis, and Rachel Louise Miller. I've been Thomas Dinas. And this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Thank you for listening. And see you again soon for the next episode. If you liked today's episode, please go to Patreon and type uh, the Delicious Legacy Podcast and um, contribute something to help me do more episodes in the future. Thank you.